neonatal consultant from Cornish Hospital in Abu Dhabi. And I'm very happy to be part of this webinar. And today, this is the second webinar in, organized by a neonatal forum of India, uh, UAE chapter. And we, ha I'm dis we have a distinguished panel today uh, with Dr. Khalid Altawi, who is the consultant neonatologist at Latifa Hospital, who is also a clinical quality expert and also faculty at Al Shams University in Egypt. So I welcome Dr. Khalid. We also have our expert speakers, Dr. Ola Augustad from Oslo, Norway, and also Dr. Mohammed Fikri, who is an expert in nutrition and neurocline uh, from Egypt. So uh, we will be, I will be passing on the mic to Dr. Khalid, who will introduce our first speaker. Hello, uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, uh, everywhere, uh, all over the globe. Uh, hoping that uh, we will enjoy this uh, gathering this evening organized by the NNF uh, UAE. Um, we're having a very good uh, collaboration with the NNF India and uh, as well as uh, UAE. So thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Sardar and uh, Dr. Monica. Uh, for uh, inviting me uh, to attend this uh, uh, webinar. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh, for introducing me. And now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, a dear colleague and uh, friend, his uh, dear professor from uh, Norway, uh, Dr. Ola uh, Dedrek Sobdat. Uh, Dr. Ola uh, is a professor of pediatrics in the Department of uh, Pediatric Research, University of uh, Oslo and the Head of Pediatric uh, Research, uh, University of Oslo and Oslo University Hospital. Uh, he is also consultant of neonatology in the same hospital. Uh, Dr. Sogdad uh, had his uh, medical school in uh, 1973. Then he uh, became a research fellow in the University of uh, Uppsala in Sweden and University of Oslo, yeah, sure. uh, and post-doctor uh, NIH grant in University of California, San Diego, then visiting associate research yeah, with sure. in University of California, San Francisco, then a trained pediatrician in Oslo University uh, Hospital, yeah, and sure. in neonatology uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the uh, same hospital. Uh, he, Dr. Ola, is a member of uh, the European Society of Pediatric Research, the European Association of Perinatal uh, Medicine, uh, Society of uh, Pediatric Research in USA, International Academy uh, of P Perinatal Medicine, and Fellow of Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh, and uh, Norway Academy of Science. Uh, he's having uh, many on honorary uh, membership, uh, the Hungarian Association of Pediatricians, the Norwegian uh, Society of Perinatal Medicine, uh, Finnish Society of Perinatal Medicine, European Association of Perinatal Medicine, and the American Pediatric Society. Uh, he's uh, su supervising and teaching uh, more than uh, 39 uh, and uh, co-supervising of another five uh, PhD students and uh, six PhD presently under supervision. Dr. Aula is having uh, many uh, awards and, on and honors. He's uh, uh, publishing uh, many articles and uh, whenever the name of uh, Aula comes, then uh, since long back, uh, it is related to the oxygenation and the uh, uh, resuscitation. Uh, and uh, we will be uh, glad uh, to listen to such an eminent speaker uh, in our uh, uh, evening. Uh, and uh, I will welcome uh, Professor Ola, and uh, he will be conducting resuscitation and delivery room handling. So, welcome, Once, Dr. Ola. Uh, one second, Dr. Ola, just a brief housekeeping notes. Yeah. Uh, we would like all our audience, if they have any questions, Please put it through the Q&A uh, box in your screens so that we can collate all the questions and we will be able to get some answers from experts tonight. Also, 
at the end of the talk there will be a survey and after finishing the survey you will be able to get your cme points so please do not forget to fill your um, fulfill your survey so i would like uh, not to waste any further time i would give mic to dr ola uh, thank you very much uh, dr rajesh and and thank you uh, uh, dr khalid for this uh, very nice uh, words it's um, it's really an honor to be invited uh, uh, to give the, these lectures and i'd like to thank uh, uh, sindar who has I believe is the president of the NNF in the Emirates, and also Monica Kausal, who is the secretary, and who I met in in uh, Delhi uh, in March. And um, so um, I'm very grateful to be um, asked to to speak to you. I have I've been to the Emirates uh, several times. I always have a good time there, and I've been to many of the Gulf um, uh, countries. And uh, I have many, many friends in this uh, region, uh, so so that's why I'm, I was very happy when I was asked uh, uh, to give a lecture. So my first lecture will be about uh, recitation and delivery room handling. Uh, originally, <clears throat> I suggested to talk about delivery room handling, but then uh, they also wanted some recitation. So I tried to make a synthesis uh, of of this. Uh, here are my disclosures, and uh, I, of course, I will not be able to cover all aspects uh, during uh, 40 minutes. But I will, I'll try to cover some of the what I think um, are the important and interesting topics. Uh, so here is the outline. At the bottom, you see that um, oxygenation. I will not talk about that in in this uh, lecture because that uh, I will cover in my in my second lecture. <laughs> So, um, just uh, a short introduction and just want to remind us all that, uh, as you all know, uh, that uh, the most uh, dangerous day in our, in our lives is, is the first day. And this is illustrated here, when you see how many newborns who die the first day compared with, with the, the rest of the, the neonatal period. Do you hear me well? Do you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. Well, thank you. So here I've tried to estimate uh, the need of intervention in the delivery room. And I'm sure many of you have seen this before, but I think it's worthwhile to repeat it. Um, so I have uh, received, uh, gotten the, the numbers from ILCOR, and from other sources. So it has been estimated that between 1 and 30 and 1 and 40 million newborns um, are born every year in this uh, world, and all of them should be assessed um, at birth. They should be dry, they should be kept warm and positioned correctly. Approximately 15 out of 100, around 20 million babies, perhaps, they need some stimulation in order to start breeding. Just some drying or rubbing um, the back, for instance. And airway should be cleared only if needed. I'll come back to that. Between three to five uh, per hundred, uh, maybe more in low-income countries, uh, but three to five percent would need bag and mask ventilation in order to start um, <clears throat> spontaneous respiration and according to ilcor 2 million two, 2 per 100 a little bit more than 2 million uh, need uh, endotracheal intubation i find this uh, number high but this is what i've i've seen ilcor is um, is giving up not that many needs uh, chest compressions less than 1 in 1000 and the same number needs need um, adrenaline and very few uh, need uh, volume expansion. Now we are talking about basic and advanced resuscitation and everything above this red line uh, represent basic resuscitation and under is advanced. Uh, and that includes endotracheal intubation, chest compressions, adrenaline and volume expansion. Now 
one of the most important um, uh, diagnoses regarding need of intervention in the delivery room is asphyxia. And as you can see here, there's a wide variation in the incidence from high income regions, 2.5 per thousand, to sub Saharan Africa, 18 per thousand. And also mortality varies a lot. But fortunately, the mortality due to perinatal asphyxia or interpartum rela uh, um, related events has been substantially reduced since the turn of the century, more than 50%. And I think that is also good news that more children survive. I try to estimate how many babies uh, can be saved by resuscitation. And um, in our own material from the 90s, uh, there was a mortality of 20% um, in low-income uh, countries. And it was estimated at that time that 4 million newborn babies suffered from birth asphyxia. Now, in, in uh, Western Europe, the mortality for the same condition is 2%. So if we are able to reduce the mortality to the same as we see in, 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 in Europe, Western Europe, we could save approximately 700,000 babies. In addition, and, and it's been shown that up to 30% of stillbirths, and that's more than 1 million of those uh, every year, can be saved by ventilation, recitation. That's another 300,000. So that adds up to approximately 1 million newborn babies. And that's an enormous uh, number uh, of saved, uh, potentially saved lives, of course. I will show you some of the, um, some very recent uh, data from a European uh, database called um, eNewborn regarding outcomes and need of recitation of low birth, less than 32 weeks, and extremely low birth with infants. We just uh, published uh, these data in pediatric research. Um, a couple of months ago. So in this um, database, we have almost 40,000 babies with the gestation age 32 weeks or less. And here you can see how these are distributed to different gestational ages with a, a peak around 31 weeks. And here we have the neonatal mortality. <clears throat> and you see that <clears throat> it's an exponential increase in uh, mortality with decreasing gestation age. So there's uh, more than 60% mortality with 22 weeks, but you see there's a very rapid uh, decrease in mortality. And, and here, after 30, 31 weeks, it's, it's a very low mortality. Here we have the odds ratio for mortalities and for 23 weeks compared with 32 weeks, it's a, almost a 40-fold increase uh, mortality. We also know that gender plays a, a role and, and we are able to show that, as you can see here, that females have a better outcome, have a lower survival than uh, boys. And also growth retardation seems to play a role, especially extreme uh, small for gestation age, less than the third percentile. They have an odds ratio for death which is between four and five. And you see here, small for gestation age, defined as less than the 10th percentile, also has an increased risk, but it's, it's quite moderate. What is the effect of antenatal steroids? Well, we know that antenatal steroids reduce mortality, but what we could show is that even an incomplete course of antenatal steroids has almost the same effect as a complete course. And that means that even if you don't have sufficient time to uh, finish a, a full course of antenatal steroids, um, give steroids because it has an effect anyway. So how many of these babies need recitation? Well, when you look at the smallest, the smallest uh, babies, almost 100%, 95% need recitation and you see how it drops here up to 32 weeks. Basic recitation, not many of the smallest babies need basic recitation, 
but that increases with gestational age, reaching a peak care around 30, 31 weeks. And the reason is that, of course, the most immature, they need advanced recitation. 90%, approximately 90%, even more, need advanced recitation. Now, what we could show in, in this uh, very large um, uh, cohort, almost 40,000 babies, is that those babies who were given basic recitation, bag and mask ventilation, oxygen, they didn't have an increased risk of death, <clears throat> which I think is very good to know. However, as soon as you need advanced recitation, mortality increased almost twofold, <clears throat> which of course is not a surprise, but uh, here we can quantify it. Now we talk a lot about the golden minute or the golden minutes, and we know all of us that what we're doing in the delivery room is so important for the newborn baby for the rest of his or her life. And here I listed some of the interventions we're doing in the, during this brief period. Cord clamping, we're applying PEEP, surfactant, temperature control, oxygen, and so forth. But of course also what we're doing in the postnatal period is so important. But here it's so fundamental for the outcome. But also antenatal factors are of course of interest and importance for outcome. I listed three here. I could list more of course. Uh, body mass index, antenatal steroids, mode of delivery. Some years ago we published um, a meta-analysis in, in JAMA where we were able to show that if maternal BMI increases, perinatal mortality increases also, as you can see here. So is this of interest for neonatologists? Y yes, it is, I think, because uh, we can educate women and, and girls and say that it is important for the outcome of your pregnancy, uh, how your BMI is. BMI is. What about C-section? Well, it has been estimated that um, as long as the C-section rate is at least 10%, there's no further decrease in mortality as shown here. Uh, but if it's less than 10% in a, a community, mortality increases. So that means that an optimal C-section rate at least when we're talking about mortality, is maybe between 10 and 15%. And we also know that there is an increase in morbidity after C-section here. I listed serious respiratory morbidity and you see all the way up to 39 weeks, there is increased morbidity after C-section. So I think that we as neonatologists, we, we have an important uh, uh, task here to inform and to talk with our obstetrical colleagues and also to give information to pregnant women and to the society that we want to keep the c-section rate low and as you know in many areas of the, the world it is uh, way too high. So let's go um, to the um, ILCOR recitation algorithm this is the algorithm from 2010. And at 2010, the so-called golden minute was introduced, the first 60 seconds of life. And it was split up in two halves here, each of 30 seconds. There was only one problem with uh, this concept, the golden minute. Ilkor had forgotten to define when is the golden minute. So I started to ask people when I was traveling around giving lecture and I asked people when do you start the clock and I got many different answers some said when the shoulders are out when the cord is cut or when the baby is on the recitation table I think we should agree on on one definition when we start a clock and that is when the whole baby is out especially when we are 
talking about the golden minute, it is important to know what a golden minute is. And also when we're giving APCA scores, we have to know that we're doing exactly the same all over the world. So according to the 2010 algorithm, you should ask three questions to each and every delivery. Is the baby born at term? Is the baby breathing? And how is the muscle tone? And if you answer yes to these three, the baby should be provided with routine care. Here. And if those of you who remember the old algorithm, you had to, the timing was changing every 30 seconds. You had to go from one task to another. That was very stressing, very difficult to achieve. Now, it was only the first sec 60 seconds that were timed. And also very important, in 2010, Ilkor uh, suggested or recommended that uh, recitation should be carried out with room air instead of 100% oxygen. So what is the indication for uh, starting uh, bag and mask ventilation? Well, it is a uh, heart rate less than 100 beats per minute and or apnea or ins insufficient breathing. Within 30 seconds after drying and stimulation. So here is a close up of what we are supposed to do during the first 60 seconds. So the first 30 seconds, the baby should be dried, kept warm, wrapped into plastic if it's less than 28 weeks. We should stimulate the breathing, position the airways correctly, and we should have recorded heart rate and breathing rate. During the next 30 seconds, respiratory support should be established if that is needed. And we should also have put on a pulse oximeter if that is available. Now the question is, are we able to do that? Well, there was a study published some years ago now from, um, um, by Lisa McCarty in, in Dublin. It was a, a collaboration between Melbourne and Dublin. And here they, they listed all the uh, intervention that we might carry out in the delivery room. And you see here how many of these were, were carried out in this study. 97% had a pulse oximeter, heart rate available, 96%, and so forth. And now they timed it and were able to show that we are not able to do this within the golden minute. Babies who need to be put into plastic, immediately that happened after 61 seconds. The first heart rate auscultated after 62 seconds. I was surprised. And first available heart rate after 70 seconds, and so forth. And here they have put up some um, of the interventions that should be performed within 30 seconds or 60 seconds. If you look here, well, most of the baby, 94%, were on the recitation table within 30 seconds, and all of them within 60 seconds. In bag, only 7% after 30 seconds, half of them after 60 seconds. Auscultation, heart rate, 7% only after 7 seconds, and a little bit less than half after a minute. First heart rate obtained after 3 and 33, um, uh, 3% uh, after. 30 seconds and 33% after 60 seconds. So this is surprising, but I think that it uh, demonstrates that it is difficult to, to achieve what we want to do during the golden minute. So maybe we have to um, redefine that uh, period. For instance, in the helping babies breed algorithm, this is what you're supposed to do in the golden minute. Now, uh, suctioning has been removed in the, in the second edition, but you see that you should be drying, stimulating the baby, start ventilating, and assess the baby within sec 60 seconds. And it's difficult to achieve that. So five years later, a new algorithm came out, and it's not so different from the 2010 algorithm, except that they have now introduced the maintain temperature line here to remind us how important it is to keep the baby in normal thermic during the whole procedure. And now they have, this golden minute is only, 
is not split up into two halves. So, how should we assess the heart rate at birth? Well, in 2015, ILCOR suggests that the heart rate immediately after birth should be determined by ECG. There are other means to do that, as you know, palpitation of the umbilical cord, use a stethoscope, pulse oximeter, ECG. Which of these should we choose? Um, because I, I was critical to ILCOR when they suggested ECG, because it had not been tested out in, in bigger studies. And also I, I asked the audience when I travel around, uh, and asked, do you have ECG in your delivery room? And at least until now, very few centers have ECG. It might change, but that was the situation around 2015. Now, um, Kamlin and coworkers from Melbourne, they have made an assessment of how to measure heart rate compared with ECG. And here is auscultation, and here is palpation, and you see that both auscultation and palpation, they underestimate the heart rate compared to the ECG and palpation more than auscultation. And the same authors, they correlated heart rate measured by pulse oximeter uh, up here versus ECG. And you see there's a very nice relation, except we have a lot of babies here in this corner where the pulse oximeter is not measuring uh, the correct heart rate, at least not correct um, compared with ECG. And some years later, Van Fonden showed that the, bl the blue lines here, pulse oximeter heart rates are lower than ECG. It underestimates the, the heart rate compared with ECG. So heart rate by auscultation is inaccurate and underestimates the heart rate obtained by ECG. Uh, together with uh, Roger Sol in Vermont in US, I wrote a commentary uh, about this. And we, we suggested that instead of counting six seconds, you can count the heart rate 10 seconds. So much of this inaccurate, inaccuracy could be eliminated. It seems that a reliable heart rate is obtained earlier with ECG than with pulse oximetry. And in one study, it was a 84 seconds difference. But on the other hand, quite a high number, percentage of the ECG signals have to be excluded due to technical problems. So I think we have to, we are waiting for new technology, for instance, Bluetooth technology, where we can measure uh, easily um, the heart rate, for instance, by using cell phones and so forth. So in 2016, uh, Roger Sol and I, we wrote, I don't know if you agree with me, but we, we wrote that auscultation is still the gold standard for assessing heart rate at birth. So what about uh, suctioning of the baby? Um, is it sufficient to, to wipe the baby? Well, in 2010, uh, Ilkor um, said that, uh, recommended that routine interpartum oropharyngeal uh, and nasopharyngeal suctioning is not needed, even for babies born with clear or meconium stained amniotic fluid, as long as they, um, they were quite active. And the reason for that is that if you, you suction a baby routinely, as been done here, the oxygen saturation is lower, up to six, seven, eight minutes, compared with those who are not suctioned routinely. And um, some years ago, Wally Carlos and his group from Alabama, they show that if you just wipe the mouth and the nose with a towel, for instance, it has the same effect as uh, uh, suctioning, at least when they assessed it by counting the, the respiratory rate the first 24 hours. 
So we don't do routine suctioning anymore. What about need of ventilation? Well, I mentioned that uh, the indication is bag and mask. Uh, the indication for bag and mask is a heart rate less than 100 and or apnea. And then you should ventilate for 30 seconds with a rate of 40 to 60. And the response is uh, how the heart rate uh, increases. Now, if the heart rate is above 100 and uh, the respiration is sufficient, you could stop ventilation. If it's between 60 and 100, continue ventilation, consider intubation. And if the heart rate is less than 60 and not increasing in spite of adequate ventilation, you should start with chest compressions. And then ventilation rate is 30 and it's 90, chest compression is three to one uh, rate, uh, 120 ev events uh, in each minute, which is it's difficult to achieve. Uh, so before we talk more about ventilation, I just want to remind you about the correct way to position um, a mask. You should roll it from the chin tip and see that it covers the mouth and nose. It should not be too big and not too small. And you should hold it with a two-point technique as shown here uh, between your thumb and your index finger. And then you should lift the chin forward. And that um, requires some skills and experience. It's not always easy. ILCOR in 2015 recommend to start with CPAP for preterm babies who are breathing spontaneously instead of intubation and um, intermittent positive pressure, uh, pressure ventilation. What about sustained inflation? I don't know if um, any of you are using that, but it has been very popular in many places in the world. But <clears throat> ILCOR suggests against the routine use of initial sustained inflation, defined as um, inflation more than uh, five seconds duration. Uh, there was a Cochrane review uh, some years ago, now three years ago, when they looked at uh, sustained inflation versus more uh, standard ventilation. And they couldn't find that the sustained inflation reduced mortality, the need for intubation, need for a duration of respiratory support, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. There was actually no evidence of, of relevant benefit for sustained inflation over intermittent ventilation. And then the sales study was, uh, came, was published. The sales study was a study recruiting babies between 23 and 26 weeks in need of positive pressure ventilation at birth, and they were randomized to a sustained inflation group. 15 seconds, the first inflation was 20 centimeter water, and the second 25. Now this study was stopped um, before it had uh, finished because it was clear that the death, early death was significantly increased in the sustained inflation group. 7.4% versus 1.4 in the control group. So what about uh, cord clamping? This has also been a very hot topic the last years in neonatology. If you measure by just putting a newborn on a scale and see how fast uh, it gains weight, that uh, reflects the transfusion from the placenta into the baby, we can see that after 60 seconds, approximately 70% of, of the transfused blood has reached the baby. And if we wait another minute, we see that almost 90% of the transfused blood has reached the baby. Now, the interest for early or late cord clamping is not new. I, I, when I prepared for this um, lecture, I, I found some uh, studies more than 50 years ago, uh, which were summarized in this um, review article by Moss and Monse Hurard, uh, published in Pediatrics in 1967. 
And they were interested in hemodynamics and they could show that late cord clamping resulted in a higher pulmonary arterial pressure, at least nine hours after birth. So this is not new. And today, I think all international organizations and bodies, they now recommend delayed cord clamping, 32 seconds to one minute uh, in preterm babies and also term babies, of course. So two or three years ago, this study was published, uh, Australian Placental Transfusion Study, the APT study. And this study, the aim was to compare death and morbidity at 36 weeks in 1,600 babies, a very large study born before 30 weeks gestation. And they were randomly allocated to immediate cord clamping within 10 seconds of birth versus delayed cord clamping, which was 60 seconds and more. And what they showed in this um, study, which was published in New England Journal of Medicine, of William Tarnamori as the first author, was that there was absolutely no effect on the primary outcome, which was death or major morbidity by 36 weeks of postmenstrual age. However, when they looked at death alone, they found a 30% reduction in mortality in those who had a delayed cord clamping. So based on this, the authors also carried out a systematic review and meta-analysis. So they found 19 clinical trials where babies had been randomized to delayed clamping versus immediate clamping, and they only looked at babies less than 37 weeks. And what they found was exactly the same as in the APT study. There was a 30% or 32% reduction in mortality after uh, delayed cord clamping. Uh, so here is some details of the study. As I mentioned, 19 trials, almost 3,000 babies. It's a large study relative a risk ratio for mortality 0.68 in the delayed cord clamping group. Number needed to treat to, to benefit was 33. Well, regarding secondary outcomes, uh, delayed clamping reduced the number of blood transfusions given. It indeed it, it increased uh, polycythemia and also jaundice. And other secondary outcomes was not was no change between the two groups. Now the next question is, is it possible to resuscitate with an intact cord? Um, and um, uh, Kateri and coworkers for San Diego, they tried to answer this question with a randomized clinical trial where they recruited babies between 23 and 31 weeks. And uh, this was published uh, some years ago. And here is a range of variables, uh, hemodynamic variables. And i have not go through this, but as you can see, there was absolutely no difference between <clears throat> those who had been resuscitated with an intact cord versus those who did not have an intact cord. So Kateri and coworkers, they concluded that it is feasible to resuscitate with an intact cord uh, but uh, so far there is no improvement in outcome. What about cord milking? Well, that is a fast method to transfuse blood from placenta to the child. <coughs> so in an emergency, this might be an advantage. So during cord milking or cord stripping, which is also called, the cord is cut at about 25 centimeters from the umbilicus within 30 seconds after birth, and then it's milked three times at a speed of 10 centimeters per second. Now, <clears throat> in one study, cord milking versus immediate cord clamping was compared, and it seemed that cord milking was um, uh, giving better outcome. These are babies between 24 and 28 weeks. Less need of transfusions, 83 versus 97, higher hematocrit, and less interventricular hemorrhage, 25 versus 51%, and also grade 
three and four, there were uh, that, there was not a difference here in this study. So um, <clears throat> another study, cord milking was compared with delayed cord clamping, and it was not found any significant differences between these two methods. Cateria also did a study in uh, babies between 23 and 31 weeks. And what he could show was that those babies who had been treated with cord milking had a higher cognitive score at follow-up, 100 versus 95 in the delayed cord clamping. So that was, of course, very promising. Also, language score was higher. However, when we look at uh, the interventricular hemorrhage rate, it is increased substantially, a fourfold increase in interventricular hemorrhage, especially for the smallest babies um, after cord milking. So I think this study kind of killed every uh, uh, interest in cord milking among the most immature babies. So what's happening here is that this is how you do the milking three times and this increases the venous return to the right atrium and it enters the foramen ovale and, and the aorta and uh, as long as the lungs are constricted, you know. If there's a lack of cerebral autoregulation, what it is in in preterm babies, and there's a right to left uh, ductal shunt, this may result in fluctuations um, in flow and an immature brain with fragile germinal matrix. This may lead to interventricular hemorrhage. So, this is one way to think about that. And then, what about physiological cord clamping? <clears throat> Went late and then cut the cord. Well, this has been studied uh, by several authors, also actually 50 years ago, but Stuart Hooper in, in Melbourne has studied that both in animals and in children. And here is an animal uh, study showing that if you clamp the cord before you start ventilation, you see here the, the blood pressure increases and the carotid blood flow increases like this. By contrast, if you wait to clamp the cord after the start of ventilation, you see this smooth transition, more, much more hemodynamically stable. I think that this is what now people are aiming at, is to do such a physiological clamping. And finally, just a few words about heat loss and temperature control. As I mentioned, the ILCOR in 2015 introduced this temperature line to remind us how important it is to keep the baby normothermic. So in order to prevent heat loss, the most immature babies are put into occlusive wrap, into plastic bags before they're dried uh, in order to reduce hypothermia. And hopefully this results in decreased morbidity and mortality. Or is that the case? Well, before I go on, I just want to show you the most recent European guidelines for babies with RDS. Came out a year ago. It is to maintain core temperature between 36.5 and 37.5 at all times. And we should keep it quite warm in the delivery room. And obstetricians don't like that. Less than 32 weeks, 23 to 25 degrees Celsius, and less than 28 weeks, 26 degrees. Now, <clears throat> very recently, a Cochrane review came out comparing plastic wra wrapping versus routine care. And yes, they were able to show that the, the core body temperature was higher when the babies are put into plastic, as shown here. But there were also more babies with hyperthermia <clears throat> in this group. So this is, of course, concerning. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> when it comes to major brain injury, there was absolutely no difference between the groups. And when they looked at deaths within hospital stay, it seems to be a small advantage of plastic wrapping. Uh, but it's not significant. But when 
they looked at the data again when the babies were six months, there was absolutely no difference in mortality, uh, whether you put the babies into plastic or not. And of course, that was disappointing. The same was shown in, in this study from, from US by Maureen Rayleigh and coworkers. You are able to prevent hypothermia by putting the babies into plastic. But these authors did not find any effect on mortality of the wrapping. Odds rates are 1.0. It was less pulmonary hemorrhage, of course. So um, <clears throat> plastic uh, wrapping reduces uh, or leads to higher temperature at admission with less hypothermia. But we have to be careful because it might increase hypothermia, uh, especially if you combine it with the thermal mattress and skin-to-skin -skin care. And there's limited evidence that it uh, is of benefit and do not give any harm. So, um, in spite of the fact that many studies have shown increased mortality among preterm infants who are hypothermic, we don't have evidence uh, enough to say that these interventions <coughs> with plastic wrapping reduces uh, in hospital mortality. So maybe hypothermia is a marker for illnesses and poor outcome by association rather than by causality. So I will just uh, end up now uh, and uh, with uh, some recommendations from the World Health Organization that was um, <clears throat> that were published uh, five years ago. I was so fortunate to be on the panel making these recommendations. And this is what uh, WHO ended up with that. They put a lot of emphasis on kangaroo mother care. It's important and it should provide it as close to continuously as possible. And if it's not possible to do it, it is better to do it intermittently uh, than not doing it according to WHO. So I will end up with uh, some of the recommendations, the European recommendations for RDS uh, as a summary of this lecture. So we aim at the delayed cord clamping at birth by at least one minute. We stabilize, still we stabilize preterm babies less than 28 weeks in plastic bag um, under a radiant warmer to prevent heat loss. But we have to know that it probably doesn't reduce mortality and we have to be aware of the possibility of hypothermia. <coughs> we prefer CPAP instead of um, uh, intubation if possible. And here's the pulse oximetry. I'll talk more about that in next lecture, so I skip that. And uh, intubation at birth should be only for those not responding to the above. And I haven't talked about surfactant um, in this study. So with this, I will thank you for attention and show you some uh, nice uh, view from uh, Norway, a greeting from my country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ola, uh, for this very informative uh, presentation. Uh, really uh, enjoyed it, uh, and I'm sure uh, the uh, attendees will. Uh, and uh, uh, we will have uh, many questions for this uh, topic. Uh, and I think it was agreed that, uh, uh, Rajesh, uh, uh, if I'm right, that we'll take the questions at the end of the second question, yes? That's agreed, yeah, correct. Yeah, okay. So audience so, can keep on posting their questions and then we will take it at the end. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, by this, uh, we finished the first session and now we are moving uh, towards the uh, second session and it will be about the uh, uh, resuscitation, the oxygenation of the uh, newborn. So uh, please, Dr. Ola. Thank you, Kali. Uh, do you see my screen well? Yes. Yeah, okay. So now uh, I, we continue directly uh, on um, oxygenation of the newborn. This is a, a favorite topic of mine. I've been uh, involved in this in, for more than 40 years. 
Um, and here's an outline of, um, of my lecture. I will say a few words about oxen and oxen toxicity. And then I will go through you, with you the data we have for uh, recitation, how much oxen we should uh, give. And also, which oxen saturation targets we should aim at the first uh, minutes after birth. And uh, if there is time, I will say a few words about oxygenation um, in immature infants beyond the delivery room. So here's my disclosures again. And <clears throat> for those of you who are interested, um, I have, together with my collaborators, written several articles the last year. This is a review article in pediatric research about oxygen therapy of the newborn. We called it from molecular understanding to clinical practice. Here's a, an article we published in Free Radical Biology and Medicine. It's more about oxidative stress in, in the newborn period. Uh, Max Vento and I, we, we published this article about the, how we should target oxygen um, immediately after birth. And very recently, this um, study about oxygen metabolism um, uh, was published, it was in April. I will recommend the whole issue of the April issue of seminars in fetal and neonatal medicine because it's uh, dedicated to oxygenation of the newborn. Um, and just a few days ago, I, we published this article in journal Pediatrics about optimizing oxygenation of the extremely premature infant during the first few minutes of life. Should we start low or should we start high? And I think that is one of the, the hot questions in, uh, in this field uh, presently. I'll come back to that at the end of my lecture. So what are the goals of our oxygen therapy? Well, of course, it's first of all to provide sufficient oxygen to the tissues and avoid anaerobic metabolism. It's to prevent hypoxic pulmonary <coughs> vasoconstriction, to promote brain and somatic growth. And as every neonatologist know, we try to minima minimize adverse effects of oxygenation. Uh, and that leads me to, the, to this uh, uh, issue, the dichotomy of oxen. We know that oxen is critical to life, but we also know that too much oxen can cause oxidative stress, lung injury and diseases, uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, also other conditions, ROP seems to be um, affected by the oxygenation, brain damage, impaired brain development and so forth. So we have to find the correct balance and that I've been working with that for 40 years, and I don't think we, we still have that balance. We don't know the balance. Yeah, and it, we also know that oxidative stress may injure other organs as, as the heart and the, and the kidney, other vital organs. So this is just a, a very brief uh, recapitulation of the biochemistry, why we need oxygen, and uh, how, how, what is happening. So if we go here, his, here we are in the mitochondria where we have oxidative phosphorylation is happening. There are five complexes here where we have the electron transport. And when the electrons are transported from one complex to the other, protons are, are pumped over the inner mitochondrial membrane and they're generating a, a gradient and this gradient can be utilized to produce ATP. So here and then what happens here is that oxygen accepts the electrons at the end of the electron transport and generates water. So that's the, that's the purpose of oxygen. It's, uh, it's an electron acceptor here. We know that some of the electrons here, they leak out and they react with oxygen and generate reactive oxygen species, RS, and fortunately they can be neutralized by antioxidants and antioxidant enzymes. Now, during hyperoxia, more free radicals are generated and 
surprisingly, less ATP is generated. I will show you some data at the end of my lecture. So we have the oxygen species. They damage a number of macromolecules as DNA, proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates. And not spend more time on that. I will go directly to the, the clinical issues and start out with uh, newborn recitation. How much oxygen should we give the term and preterm babies during resuscitation? Well, you know, traditionally, neonatologists have used a lot of oxygen in the delivery room. And the question is, why? Why did pediatricians and neonatologists love oxygen? I think we have to go back to some of our basic uh, literature. This is um, Virginia Acker's uh, first article in 1953 regarding the, the APCA score. You know that in order to get an APCA score of 9 or 10, the baby has to be pink. And there's only one way to make a newborn baby pink the first minutes after birth, and that is to give oxygen. And that was what happened many places in the world. In South America, for instance, it was routine to give every newborn baby a dash of oxygen to pink them up to get a high APCA score. And in fact, Virginia Apgar and her peers 60 years ago, soon 60 years ago, they used a lot of oxygen. 20% of her original uh, population cohort were given oxygen by some mean or the other. So there was a competition to get as high APCA score as possible. And today we, we, we know that this was not uh, very fortunate, I think. Just a very brief recapitulation of the transition. We know that in fetal life, the fetus is hypoxemic, a low PO2, saturation between 50 and 65%. And then when the baby is born and during the normal transition, the pulmonary hypertension resolves and there's a gradual improvement in oxygen saturation. So cyanosis is normal during fetal life and for the first few minutes after birth. So it's probably not possible to get an Africa score of nine or 10 the first minute of life without giving oxygen. When you look at how the saturation develops in normal babies, you can see here that um, at two minutes, this is preductal values, the mean value is just above 70, and you see the wide variation. And even at five minutes here, that many of these babies have saturations less than 80. So that is uh, the situation. Um, and maybe the reason that um, oxygen was uh, given to so many babies from the 50s and 60s and, and onwards. What happens if you give 100% oxygen? Well, we have several clinical studies, but also animal studies showing that you get an enormous PO2 peak. This is from a study in Sweden by Linner and co-workers where they made newborn lambs asphyctic by clamping the cord. And when they got cardiac arrest, they randomized the, the lambs to be resuscitated with 100% or 21% oxygen. You see the red line here. Is the, represents the PO2 when, um, let's see the pointer is, well, yeah, the pointer here it is. The, the PO2 increased to very high levels. By contrast, if you give room air, you see there's a slow increase and normalization of the PO2. Even in the brain, you get this enormous peak in brain tissue PO2 with 100% oxygen compared with air and also the saturation, you get the same big differences. Even a three minute exposure to 100% oxygen gives this very high peak compared with room air. So before 1998, the world map regarding the use of oxygen for newborn recitation looked something like this. All guidelines recommended to use 100% oxygen. 
I haven't, uh, I didn't know exactly what they did in Africa and some of these countries. But basically, every every guideline said use 100% oxen. If you don't have oxen, this you shouldn't start ventilation. It was even believed at that time. So for those babies at that time, before 1998, who were went, were resuscitated, they had this enormous PO2 peak. But then in the 90s, we carried out two clinical studies where we randomized term and near-term infants to be resuscitated with air or 100% oxygen. And here is a meta-analysis we published in 2008. At that time, there were 10 studies, including more than 2,000 babies, where, where the babies had been randomized to air or 100% oxygen. And what we found was that there was a 30% reduction in mortality if you start with air instead of 100% oxygen. So the world map started to change. And in 2006, actually, Canada was the first country which switched from 100% oxygen to air. And then Australia, some months later, uh, came after. And then Finland, Sweden, Russia, UK, the Netherlands, Spain, they switched to air. Some countries, including my own, they were a little bit more hesitant and said, well, we, we choose something in between, 40% for instance. The most conservative were the Americans. They, they didn't change at that time. So during this um, period, some babies got this very high PO2 peak and others got a more physiological uh, uh, treatment. But in 2010, ILCOR changed the guidelines and recommended that in term infants receiving recitation at birth with positive pressure ventilation, it is best to begin with air rather than 100% oxygen. So then now the world map changed like that, um, not from one day to the other, but uh, after some time, I think now all guidelines recommend to use, start with air for term and near term infants. And we have this more physiological approach. So we try to illustrate uh, what's happening if you give air versus 100% oxygen. So the, here is the PO2. It is normalized slowly, um, but it's not too high. Some free radicals are generated for sure. By contrast, if you give 100% oxygen, you get this enormous peak, PO2 peak, and you get this wave of free radical generation. And this affects the, the child with cerebral vascular constriction, brain inflammation, pulmonary vascular reactivity increases, and it's also been shown that you get damage to the heart and to the kidneys. And a high FiO2, the first 10 minutes of life, is also associated with the increased risk of childhood leukemia. Now, a year ago, a new meta-analysis was published, um, including most of the same babies as we included in our meta-analysis meta -analysis in 2008. This was from Wellsford and co-workers. And fortunately, uh, at least to my relief, they found more or less the same as we, we did, an almost 30% reduction in mortality if you start with air compared with 100% oxygen. And these authors said that there will unlikely be any further studies on this topic. I'm not sure about that. It could still be some subgroups we haven't studied in detail who might need some more oxygen uh, during recitation. They also looked at uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, grade two and three, and there was no difference whether you start high or low, which I think is good to know that you don't get more adverse effects by starting with air compared with 100% oxygen. And also when they looked at uh, neurodevelopmental injury, there was no difference. There's only two studies. It's my own and a study from Bajai in India. So we need, we would have wished to have more data on this topic. So for term and near-term infants, 
if you start with air, you reduce brain inflammation and perhaps also hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Mortality is decreased, cardiac injury and also pulmonary hypertension is decreased and renal injury and risk of leukemia. So there's not much discussion about that now. We start with air in these babies. But what about preterm infants? We know that preterm infants are different compared with term infants. I will not go into details because all of you know that. I just want to remind you that preterm babies, they react to hypoxia differently compared to term babies. They go into bradycardia right away, which might increase the risk of interventricular hemorrhage. They have lowered defense against oxidative stress. And they have surfactant deficiency, of course, and they have, yeah, oops. Yeah, and they have weaker muscles and so forth. So they're different compared to term infants. So what did the ILCOR recommend? Well, in 2010, when it changed from oxygen to air for term and near-term infants, they said that because many preterm babies less than 32 weeks gestation will not reach target saturations in air, blended oxygen and air may be given judiciously and ideally guided by pulse oximetry. Now, Ilkor didn't mention which FiO2 you should start out with, and that was probably quite smart because at that time, I think we didn't know. But in 2015, um, they changed their, the wording a little bit, and now they recommended against initiating resuscitation of preterm newborns less than 35 weeks with high supplementary oxygen concentrations, that is 65 to 100%. And for babies, um, yeah, they didn't say probably less than 35 weeks, but they don't specify that. But they recommend initiating resuscitation with a low oxygen concentration. 21 to 30%. So that is ILCOR 2015. What does the European recommendation say? They say that oxygen should be controlled by using a blender. An initial FO2 of 30% is appropriate for babies less than 28 weeks and 21 to 30% for those between 28 and 31 weeks. Adjustments should be done guided by pulse oximetry. So what is the evidence for such uh, recommendations? The question is, of course, should we start low and tighter down, or should we start high, uh, start low and tighter up and start high and tighter down? One of the first studies in this field was published uh, by Max Ventos Group in, in Spain. And here they randomized babies less than 29 weeks in the delivery room to 30% or 90% oxygen if they needed ventilation. What you see here is that there is absolutely no difference in the saturation between these groups. And the reason for that is perhaps that there is a difference in FO2 only three or four minutes because FO2 was adjusted uh, very quickly. No difference in heart rate, but I don't have those data here. But, but what I found was that there was more uh, oxidative stress and also more inflammation in the babies who started out with a 90%, although the FL2 was higher only for a few minutes. So then the torpedo trial was published. And this is a, a study we carried out uh, with the basis from Australia. Um, I think also some Gulf countries uh, participated in this uh, study. And babies less than 32 weeks uh, were randomized to air or 100% oxygen in the delivery room if they needed positive pressure ventilation. And what we couldn't find any difference in mortality when you looked at the whole cohort. However, when we did a post hoc analysis of babies less than 28 weeks, to our surprise, and I would say also concern, we found an almost fourfold increased risk of mortality in those who had been started with air. 
So the smallest babies start with air had a higher mortality. When we looked at um, primary outcome, which was death or disability, we also found that those babies who had reached a saturation of 80% or more within five minutes had a significantly reduced reduction, reduced um, primary outcome, 50% reduction, as you can see here. So this was, of course, exciting. So we, we carried out a updated review and meta-analysis, uh, and we looked at studies where preterm babies had been randomized to re, re, uh, receive a high FO2, which we defined as 60 to 100% versus a low FO2 defined as 21 to 30% oxygen. We were able to find eight studies, um, which we included in the meta-analysis. Meta and what we found here for mortality, when we looked at all the babies upper panel here, it was that there was absolutely no difference in mortality, whether you start high or low. But then we, we split the data up in, in mask studies and unmasked studies. And for mask studies, there was an advantage to start low. But for unmasked studies, there was an advantage to start high. So this is, of course, a little bit confusing, and we, we don't have the solution of this yet, but we know that the mass studies are the most recent ones when we started to titrate more carefully according to uh, pulse oximetry and so forth. So it might be that it's still an advantage to start low in, in these uh, smallest babies, but we, we don't know. But our results from the torpedo trial that led to a renewed interest in how saturation should develop optimally the first minutes after birth. And here, Max Venter and I, we have drawn a curve where we're trying to illustrate what we believe is the normal, whatever that is for babies less than 29 weeks, the normal increase in saturation the first minutes after birth. And it starts at two minutes, median values and two standard deviations. And you see here, that the median value is around 50. At five minutes, it's 65. And uh, it takes another five minutes maybe to reach uh, about 80%. Now, when you're talking about how the saturation should develop, um, we have to be aware that it also depends on other factors. For instance, whether or not you are using a PEEP, if you're ventilating with a T-piece, device, the saturation increases faster than if you just use bag and mask without a peep. And there's also a gender difference. Girls have a more rapid increase in saturation compared with boys, probably because their lungs are more mature than boys. And we also know uh, now know that um, cord clamping affects the, how the saturation develops. This is from a study from Nepal, babies about 33 weeks, but it shows that saturation is higher after delayed cord clamping, which uh, I think is an important observation. Now we have um, been uh, able to identify 707 infants less than 32 weeks, which have been included in, in studies uh, in the delivery room uh, given high or low oxygen saturation. We, we found four, four groups, those who had uh, started with air, those who started with 30%, oxygen 60 to 65%, and 90 to 100%. And we also split the, the material up in babies less than 29 weeks and 29 weeks or more. And then we... It, we uh, made these uh, graphs of how the saturation develops the first 10 minutes after birth, um, according to which FO2 we started out with. And here we have babies about 29 weeks. Now the shaded area here is the recommend, recommended target by American Heart Association. And these 
circles are targets from the European Investigation Council. Now, we don't know if these recommended targets are optimal because they are not evidence-based. They're basically based on our results. But what you see here is that for babies about 29 weeks, they are above or close to the target uh, almost immediately after birth. The only exception is the baby's given room air. It takes six minutes to reach target. For babies less than 29 weeks, the situation is different. Now it's only those who received 90 to 100 percent who reach target within two, three minutes. All the other groups, it takes six, seven, maybe eight minutes to reach target. Now we don't know if this is bad or good, but I think it's an interesting observation. Now everybody knows that it's not easy to to reach the target. Here we have uh, uh, the Dawson curves, the 25th to the 50th percentile, which we think we should should be a target, but it, it's not evidence based. But that's what we suggest. And here is a baby; it's above the target. Then we decrease the FO2 10 percent. Then the baby is within target for some seconds. Then it's under, so we increase FO2 another 10 percent up, still under target, and we increase another 10 percent, and then. After almost five minutes, the baby is within target. So it's not easy to, to reach the target. When we did a follow-up of the torpedo babies, what we found was that cognitive score was significantly higher in those babies who had reached a saturation of 80 or more within five minutes. You see there's more than a five-point difference so then we started to think that maybe it is important to aim at a saturation of 80%, at least 80% within five minutes. There was also a higher mortality rate for those babies who didn't reach the saturation of target of 80, and also more severe interventricular hemorrhage, that there was no effect on BPD. So then again, the same question, should we start with a low FO2 and tighter it up, or start high and tighter it down? Well, that is not easy. If you start low, and this is a study recently published from Austria, showing how the saturation develops in babies who did not reach a saturation target of 80% versus those who reached a saturation of 80%. And here we have the heart rate. And what you see here is that for instance, at three minutes, is two minutes, three minutes. Well, there's significant differences, but you know, if you're in the delivery room, it's not big differences between these groups. It's very hard for the clinician. I think it's impossible to, from a saturation value at two or three minutes, to say this baby will reach a target of 80% within five minutes or not. And when I look at FI2, in these two groups, you see it's even more difficult because there's no difference in FO2 the first three, four minutes between the groups. So for that reason, several uh, colleagues will say, well, it's better to start high and tighter it down because then we are sure that we reach a target of 80%. One argument for that comes from a study carried out in in Melbourne, Australia, in newborn kittens. It uh, was done by Arjen de Paz, who is now in the Netherlands, and Stuart Hooper in Melbourne. So what they did in these immature kittens, they, they recorded the breeding rate when they were given air after birth. Then they were switched to oxygen. You see, breeding rate increased. Then back to oxygen, uh, then back to, yeah, not back to, air, but here is nitrogen, then breathing rate goes down. They also measured the time the glottis uh, was open, and they found that, well, it's increasing here, also with air, but when they gave oxygen, the glottis was open longer than when the animals were ventilated with air. Very recently, um, 
Decker and co-workers from the same group, uh, now from the Netherlands, studied um, newborn babies 30 weeks or less. And what they found was that they had one group started with 30% oxygen and one group starting with 100% oxygen. And then they titrated up or down according to this algorithm here. What they found was that the babies started high here. Well, of course, they were more pink. They had a higher min minute volume, shorter duration of mass ventilation. They had a higher oxygenation at five minutes, shorter duration of hypoxemia. But they had a higher FR2 exposure during the first minute. When, when they looked at the total outcome, there was no difference in duration of hyperoxemia and there was no difference in oxidative stress markers, but they had a very short follow-up in this study. So these um, authors would argue that um, you should start high and tighten it down. But of course, you should keep the oxygen high as short, as brief as possible. Well, before I, I continue, I would like to remind you why oxygen is so toxic in the newborn, especially the preterm baby. They have a reduced uh, protection against oxidative stress. Oxidative phosphorylation is reduced. Hyperoxia increases inflammation. And DNA protection and repair are downregulated. Cell growth is affected. This is a study one of our studies from newborn mice, hypoxic newborn mice, and we resuscitated them with different oxygen concentrations, 21%, 40%, 60%, and 100%. And what we found in the brain is that there was a downregulation of oxidative phosphorylation. Those, those animals who received 60 or 100% oxygen. So, in all the five complexes of oxidative phosphorylation, there was a downregulation of genes, um, as illustrated here, which means that ATP production is probably reduced when you resuscitate with a hyperoxic um, gas mixture. I also want to remind you that um, hyperoxia leads to epigenetic changes. I don't have time to to show you uh, these data. So what we recommend, and we just published these recommendations, people may argue with us and disagree with us, but we, we think that uh, if you give supplemental oxygen, even very brief in immature babies, it leads to increased oxidative stress, inflammation, genomic changes, reduced DNA repair, and cell growth inhibition also long-term epigenetic changes. Still, oxygen may be needed in the most immature infants, those less than 28 weeks, but it should be given as low and brief as possible. So we still think that we should start low, 30% oxygen, and tighten it up according to the saturation and the clinical response, and heart rate is the best way to evaluate the response. But it's clear that we, we don't know what is the optimal starting initial FO2 in these babies? For that reason, we are planning a new study, a new torpedo trial, we call Torpedo 3060, where we want to randomize uh, babies less than 29 weeks to 30% oxygen or 60% oxygen. And we still are interested in recruiting uh, units. So if any one of you are interested in joining, please contact me or Rebecca Brown. Uh, at email, as shown here. And then I have a few minutes uh, left, I hope. Uh, is that correct, Chairman? Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, I, yes, sir. Yeah. so I just finished very briefly with, with how we should uh, oxygenate extremely low birth weight infants beyond the delivery room. And then I, of course, refer to the Neoprom study, studies, the trials. And the question these trials asked was what is the optimal target saturation for preterm neonates that would result in 
the lowest deaths and neurodisability. So there are five studies, the surfactant, positive pressure, and oxygenation randomized trial, the support trial from US, the Canadian oxygen trial from Canada, and the benefits of oxygen saturation targeting, the boost, the, the boost uh, two trials from UK, New Zealand, and Australia. So babies less than 28 weeks were randomized before 24 hours of age to a low saturation target, 85 to 89 percent, or a high saturation target, 91 to 95 percent. It was a big study, almost 5,000 babies included. And what was found was that there was more necrotizing anticholitis in the low saturation target. There was also more mortality, but there were more ROP in the high saturation target. Now, in 2010, guidelines, at least um, European guidelines, said that oxygen saturation target should be between 85 to 93. Based on the Neoprom studies, guidelines changed, both the European guidelines and American Academy of Pediatrics. So now saying that target should be between 90 and 95 or, or 90 to 94, uh, based on this. Here is a meta-analysis I, uh, I carried out, uh, published some years ago now, um, showing the mortality. And you see that all these meta-analysis, the three, show that there is an increased mortality in the low saturation arm. On the, on the other hand, there's less ROP, severe ROP, not more blindness, so no effect on interventricular hemorrhage, and no effect on BPD. But necrotizing anticholitis was higher in the low saturation target. So then I, I looked at uh, the risk difference between the two study groups, and here we have some outcome variables, and above this line means that it favors a high saturation target, and under it favors a low saturation target. So, and here we have the p-values, and see for mortality, there is a significant difference between the groups. It's higher mortality in the low saturation groups, and also for neck, necrotizing anticholitis, I said. ROP is the opposite, and also BPD, however, when BPD was defined physiologically, we didn't find any significant difference. So, oxygen targets between 91 to 95% increase ROP in need of therapy, but not severe vision, not more blindness, fortunately. Targets between 85 and 89% increase mortality and necrotizing anticholitis. So you have to find the right balance. Long-term follow-up didn't show any differences between these two arms regarding death, disability, blindness, hearing loss, blood pressure. Yeah, hyperoxia may lead to epigenetic changes in the lung. We don't know if these are long-lasting or transient. So this was very brief about the neoproms. I could say much more about that, but the time doesn't permit. So I just want to summarize. Uh, I think that today we are able to individualize our oxygen therapy much more than just a few years ago. In the delivery room, for babies about 31 weeks, we should still start with air. 21 to 31 weeks, start with air or 30% oxygen. I think most of us would say start with 30% oxygen. Less than 28 weeks, they absolutely need some oxygen. We don't know what is optimal. So we, we have recommended 30% oxygen, but it might be 40%, uh, which is maybe even higher, is the optimal for these babies. And we need more research in this field. For all gestational ages, adjust according to saturation. And we think that we should start low and tighter up. We need randomized studies to test the significance of saturations above 80% or lower than 80% the first five minutes of 
age and how it should be adjusted. But it's not easy to do such randomized studies. And in the future, we have to individualize according to gender, whether or not we're using CPAP or PEEP, cord clamping. Beyond 28 weeks, target saturation between 91 to 95, or 90 to 94%, as we recommend in, in Europe, because we don't want to have too high alarm limits. We have put very tight alarm limits. The first recommendations are, are from American Academy of Pediatrics and the second from the European uh, recommendation. You see the very tight alarm limits. And of course, that is very difficult for the nurses to, to keep that. Uh, but we want to emphasize that we don't want fluctuations and we don't want uh, saturation to increase to too high levels. It should prefer, preferably not be higher than 95 to 96 percent. So with this, I would like to close and thank my collaborators, uh, Siddha Dramji in, in New Delhi, who was uh, a pioneer um, uh, doing the first study on room air in, in uh, Maulana Asad Medical College in, in Delhi. Very brave of him to do that. Max Vento, I've also been working with for 25 years, is one, also one of the pioneers in room air recitation. Satya and Laksmin Rushima, I had the pleasure to work with now for many years. He is uh, now at UC Davis, and he has given me so many of these wonderful illustrations. And then Julie Owe from Sydney, who has been very instrumental and, and a driving force behind the torpedo trials and, and following up all these um, premature babies. And Vishal Kapadia from Dallas, who's also contributed a lot, especially with the significance of the heart rate, the first five minutes. I didn't have time to show these data, but hopefully they will be published very soon. So with this, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I'll try to answer your questions uh, as good as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ola, for this uh, magnificent lecture and uh, information. Uh, and uh, I can request Rajesh to, to start the questions. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Ola, we had a number of questions from audience. Uh, one of the questions uh, was asked by Dr. K. Sangvi. And he mentions that with all the difficulties during uh, the resuscitation, especially in the golden minute, with so many things to be done, do you think that we should make the golden period to 90 seconds instead of 60 seconds at the moment? Hi, did you hear my yes, question? I, I heard that, yeah. Okay. I think that's an excellent question. And. Uh, yeah, I think we have to realize that we are not able to, and we, if you look at many studies, for instance, from low-income countries, it's, it's very difficult to, to achieve what we want during the gold minute. So the, the question is, of course, should we still say that this is our goal and not compromise with the 60 seconds? Or should we be more realistic and say that we're talking about the, the golden 90 seconds. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, of course, the golden minute is now uh, um, a term which people are familiar with, but I think that uh, as in the old days when we, the, the algorithms were so stressing, we had to move after 30 seconds from one box to the other in the algorithm. It was impossible to do that. And if we are not able to achieve what we want during the golden minute. Maybe we should be real realistic and suggest 90 seconds instead, yes. But I will be very happy to, to discuss this with you and hear uh, the opinion of, of many of you because it's not an easy answer, I think. Absolutely. Dr. Khalid, do you have any question? Yeah, uh, there is one question uh, again. What is the role of RAM cannula as a primary mode for management of RDS? Oh, yeah, well, uh, then uh, I think we should have a ram here to answer that question. <laughs> because I, 
I, I listened to one of his lectures recently where the ram cannula was discussed, but I, I have to admit I never tried it myself. Uh, so if you ask uh, Dr. Ramanathan himself, who has invented this, he will, he, he will say it works well, but I heard others have some objections, but I'm not an expert on that. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, so I have a question from one of the attendees. Um, do you recommend umbilical cord milking in term infants, or you prefer delayed cord clamping? I, I prefer delayed cord clamping. I don't think anyone is recommending uh, cord milking, even in term babies. Uh, however, if you have an acute situation where you feel that it's important to, you cannot wait and you cannot do resuscitation with an intact cord, it might be a, it might be a good idea to, to do a cord milking. I have to admit that in my practice, I've never done it. Um, so uh, so uh, again, I think this is, uh, you can do it. I mean, I don't, as far as I know, it doesn't give any harm to a term baby. You can do it. Uh, I think it's a, a practic practical matter. But uh, I, I, I haven't seen any international guidelines recommending to use it. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Ola, for this information. I will tell you something. Uh, in the latest recommendation of the seventh edition NRP, it was mentioned uh, a line that if uh, the uh, uh, late cord clamping cannot be done, uh, uh, cord milking can be uh, an option. Yeah, yeah, I, I yes. agree completely. Yeah. I agree completely. Uh, yeah. But I will tell you something. Uh, when we made the, our golden hour uh, guideline at the hospital, uh, and we read the latest uh, a systematic review published in uh, February to, to, to 2020, and it is mentioning about the increase of incidence of IVH with the cord milking. So we stopped the cord milking for the preterm babies. So I think uh, uh, we we are online uh, with your recommendation that uh, cord milking should not be done. So, yeah, 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 I agree on that. Yes, yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm having another question here. Uh, it was written in the slide. Uh, dry as first in NRP, but in algorithm provide warm. Uh, suction if necessarily, then dryness, what I can do first? Um, whether you should uh, dry or keep warm or suction? Yeah. Well, yeah, well, suction should not be done routinely. So uh, whether you should dry first or keep the baby, I think, I, th I think, I mean, if it's a, a small baby, less than 28 weeks, you, you, we don't dry them. We just put them into the wrapping into plastic. If it's a bigger baby, I, I don't think anyone has really studied that. But if you ask my opinion, I would dry first and then keep the baby warm. And I, uh, because, you know, if the baby is wet, it will lose the heat. So that's what I would answer to this. I don't know if, uh, what, what do you say? I, I agree with it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, one more question, which is uh, come from the Mr. Levert Mamani. Uh, the question is, what do you think of resuscitation with intact cord? Yeah, I think the idea is good. And uh, Dr. Hutchin from uh, UK has been uh, promoting this for years. And, and the idea is excellent, but then this study by Cateria from San Diego came out don't showing any clear benefit. So, um, on the other hand, we know that asphyctic babies, they probably would need the volume of, of blood. I mean, so I would hesitate to do a, a, a early clamping in these babies. Um, so uh, it depends on on the practical situation. I mean, we, we shouldn't delay the, the recitation by waiting for uh, cord clamping. Yeah. Um, so if it's not possible to, to start recitation, uh, it is a good idea to do it on an intact cord, but uh, I wouldn't, I don't think I would put this up as a, 
the first priority uh, based on the, the data I showed you from Cateria. A supplementary question on the same. Uh, so as we know, you, we all recommend, or some, a lot of people recommend that delayed cord clamping should be done. But what is your view if the babies, is, it's in babies who are periviable or who are non-vigorous preterm infants? Um, whether you should do a delayed cord clamping? Yeah, in the babies who are periviable, like 22, 23 week gestation babies, or those who are not very vigorous at time of birth. Well, again, I would say if it, to delay the cord clamping should not intervene in the handling of the baby. Uh, but I would, uh, I think these babies need their, this blood volume. Um, so if if you are able to to start the ventilation and then wait with a, I mean, uh, and then wait with a uh, cord clamping, I think that is an advantage also in these babies. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ola, uh, there is another question here regarding the cord milking. They, they agree that it is uh, not to be used in the preterm, but what mm -hmm. about the term baby? Uh, uh, if it can be used as alternative to delay core clamping in the vigorous crying babies, is there any evidence? Yeah, it, it can be used, and I think it is. It gives the same results, uh, at least according to one or two studies. So um, uh, it can absolutely be be applied. On the other hand, I mean, if it is no urgency, I don't see why we shouldn't just wait uh, one or one minute uh, and then clamp the cord. So, but but I think that's a matter of, uh, I mean, we, it's different opinions, so what is most practical? Our next one is a specific question on a specific condition. Uh, Mr. Ambrish Sharma is asking, in CDH babies or congenital diaphragmatic hernia babies, yeah. what level should we start oxygenation? What should be the yeah, yeah, that's a very good question, and uh, these babies should not be started with uh, air. Uh, and if you go to, for instance, the recommendations from um, uh, Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, uh, they say start with 50% oxygen in these babies, and then titrate according to response. So these, this is a subgroup of babies who should not be started with air. And, and I think the, the best uh, uh, evidence now is to start with 50% in these babies. Okay. Uh, Dr. Oral, there is a question from Dr. Ahmed Zakaria. He's telling, if I'm attending antenatally diagnosed cyanotic heart disease, what would be the target saturation with which I can transport the baby to an ICU? Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not, uh, um, it depends, of course, a little bit on, on, uh, on which um, uh, congenital heart defect it is. It was a cyanotic heart defect, yeah. Cyanotic. Yeah, well, you know, it shouldn't be too high. I, I'm not sure if I can give a good answer to that question, uh, because uh, we don't want the, the saturation to be too high in these babies. Uh, and we know that they can tolerate uh, a lower saturation, uh, um, but uh, I, I'd, I would hesitate to give uh, some uh, clear numbers for saturation in such babies. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, another one from Dr. Nitin Srinivasan on congenital diaphragmatic hernia babies. Is there a role for delayed cord camping? specifically for improving the outcome in CDS babies? Um, yeah, I wish I could answer that uh, uh, because uh, uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure actually, but I, if, you, if you look at uh, this recommendation, I don't have that uh, in mind, but the recommendation from um, Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, they say something about that. Uh, but um, I th I'm not sure, I, I will hesitate to answer that also because I am not uh, remember exactly 
uh, but it's a very it's a very relevant question. I think I'll put the last question, Dr. Khalid, if you have any or anything. Okay. Um, the uh, I think we we covered all the questions, and some of the questions are uh, uh, duplicated. So. Yes. Uh, by this, um, I would like to thank uh, Professor Ola uh, for his uh, very excellent, elegant presentations. Personally, uh, I learned from uh, Dr. Ola uh, much about the oxygenation and the oxygen toxicity syndrome. I was uh, first to hear about this definition when I attended one of his uh, lectures in Hippocrates in Italy. And uh, once I came back, uh, we started uh, to do uh, quality improvement, improvement projects uh, in our hospital to reduce the incidence of IVH and ROP uh, because uh, we knew that both are related to the oxygen radical uh, toxicity. And uh, we, we had a good results after uh, this lectures and this information. So thank you, Dr. Ola, for your uh, informative uh, lectures and teaching uh, generations and generations and um, by this uh, I conclude the, the session. Thank you Dr. Ula, especially because you are on vacation and you took yeah. time for us to yeah. give such an excellent lecture. Thank you very much and I thank you on behalf of NNF in UA chapter. Thank you, it's been a pleasure and an honor. I wish you all the best. Take care you, of all Ola. of you. Okay, Bye. so Bye. next we will have uh, another session on nutrition. We will have Dr. Muhammad Fikri, who is the medical and scientific of, uh, officer affairs manager. He's uh, done masters in endocrine and nutrition at Al Shams University. So uh, I would welcome Dr. Muhammad Fikri. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, it's quite a challenge and an honor to present after Professor Ola. And I want uh, to say it was, uh, such a elegant and informative presentation. So thank you very much. I also want to thank uh, the NNFI for giving us the opportunity to present today in front of the, our elite doctors uh, representing the whole uh, region. So I am Mohammed Fikri Abul Yazid, the Medical and Scientific Affairs Manager for Wise Nutrition. I hope you can see my screen now. Yes. Okay, perfect. Today I'm going to talk about the immune nutrition. As you can see that the time allocated for the session is quite short, so we are going to focus on one of the immune nutrition, which is the human milk oligosaccharides. Before restarting, I want to emphasize about the commitment of WISE Nutrition to the WHO code recommendation for exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months and to be continued for two years or beyond. For sure, breast milk is the best, and it is not just a statement we have to mention, but we, we totally uh, convinced that breast milk is the best and it's tailored by God for our little precious miracles all through the centuries and all religions emphasize on the importance of the breastfeeding. So when we talk about the immunity, it is the ability of the body to fight harmful organisms. And as you know that our, mature, our immune system are maturing with us while we are growing. As we can see that the immune system maturity starts from birth or even before birth and continue in, especially in the first few years of life. But this usually puts the baby in a protection gap. First, our babies are receiving their immunity passively from the mother and then they took some time to develop their own immune system. But during this time, we are going to face a protection gap where the baby's immune system is still maturing. And here comes the role of the breastfeeding. First, the baby are going to receive its immune globulins like IgG from the mother crossing the placenta. But till the baby start to develop his own immune system, he are going to receive the immunity through breastfeeding, for example, through the immunoglobulin A. So breastfeeding, contains a lot of proactive and bioactive factors that are present in the breast milk, not only secretory IgA, but also contain bifidus factors, lysozyme, lactoferrin, and nucleotides. All of them can support the immune system of the baby. And last but not least, it contains a protective bioactive factor, which is the human milk oligosaccharides or HMOs. So what, what are what the milk oligosaccharides? Please allow me to take you in a journey back in time, specifically to the year 1890 when they found that infant mortality rate was extremely high, ranging from 20 to 30%, and they found that breastfed infant 
have a survival advantage over formula or bottle fed infants. In 1930, they discovered that mother's milk contained an unidentified carbohydrate fraction, and this carbohydrate was not present in the cow's milk, and it had a bifidogenic effect. In 1954, they start to discover the different type of human milk oligosaccharides. And from 1954 to just a few years ago, all the companies are trying to manufacture this human milk oligosaccharides, but all their trials go to vain. Until finally, the human milk oligosaccharides, the most abundant one with 2FL, was present, and Weiss Nutrition was the first to introduce it in the Middle East. Before going deep, the 2FL are approved both by the FDA as well as EFSA as safe to be used in infant formula and follow-up and grown-up formula. So what is the human milk oligosaccharide? As you know, that the breast milk uh, composition mainly from water, but in the solid components of the breast milk, we have the lactose is a predominant one, followed by lipids. And here comes the surprise. We had the human milk oligosaccharide as the third most abundant solid component in the breast milk. And in sometimes it is almost more than the level of the protein. And this human milk oligosaccharide increased them dramatically in the cholesterol reaches 20 to 25 gram per liter. We have about more than 200 type of human milk oligosaccharide, yet one type in particular, which is called the 2FL, 2-fucosyl lactose, represent about 30% of the total human milk oligosaccharides. And it is the one that's most studied and the one is a dominant in the breast milk and the one added to the infant formula. So what are the HMO? Just one slide about the biochemistry. It's formed of lactose base, and we have only five monosaccharides. Glucose, galactose, and acetylglucosamine, fucose, and sialic acid. So in order to form the 2FL, which is formed from lactose base and, uh, and fucose as the position number two, all we need to do is to bring this fucose and put it at the position number two. But in order to do this, we need certain enzymes, which called the FUT2 or 1,2-fucosyl transferase enzyme. And this enzyme is coded on a certain gene, which is called the secretor gene. So to conclude this part, the mother needs to be secretor positive in order to have the enzyme, which is called the FUT2 enzyme, so she can secrete the 2FL. Life is not uh, fair. Not all women are secretor positive, yet from God mercy to us that the majority of women, about 80% of the women worldwide, are secretor positive and can produce the 2FL. So how this 2FL or the HMO are going to act? And what are their mechanism of action? As you can see, I'm going to use this as our actress for today, representing the HMO, bifidobacteria, pathogens, and surface glycan. The first mechanism of action is HMO is a prebiotic effect, increase the number and or activity of the good bacteria or the bifidobacteria, the beneficial one, on the expense of the pathogenic one. And this are going to lead to secretion of SCAFA, short chain fatty acid, which is an energy source for the immune cell. Also, these are going to lower the pH, which are going to favor more the growth of the bifidobacteria, the good bacteria, and it will compete for the resources with the pathogenic one. This study was a lab study made by Hofflinger et al. in 2015. He, was, he cultured 11 of the most pathogenic bacteria like Escherichia, Chronobacter, Enterobacter on different media with different agars. One containing glucose, FOS, and three types of HMO, one of them was 2FL. He found that neither any of these pathogens grow on the agars containing the HMO, and one of them was the 2FL. Lewis et al. at the microbiome in 2015 started to compare babies who are breastfed from secretor mothers contain HMO2FL and foot negative mothers who don't contain the 2FL. As you can see, the one in red is the one containing the 2FL. As you can see, first he found that there was significant increase in the bifidobacteria, which is a good bacteria, but by the way, this was expected. What was really interesting in Lewis' study that he found that there was significant decrease in the streptococcus in, mother, in babies who are taking uh, mother's milk with 2FL. And this will bring us to the second mechanism of action. As you know, usually for pathogens to start to infiltrate the cell, they first need to attach to the surface glycan. He found that the human milk oligosaccharide resembles the same structure of the glycan. So it will deceive the pathogen so instead of the passion of attaching to the glycan, it will attach to the HMO. HMO cannot be digested, so it will take the passage and go outside of the body. 
Also, they found that HMO can assist and change the glycan shape by assisting the gut barrier. They trigger uh, enzymatic changes of the glycan, changing the shape of the glycan, so the pathogen cannot fit to it and cannot attach to it, prevent attachment, which may prevent the infection. Maro et al. in 2004 in Journal of Pediatric found that infant fed uh, breast milk with 2FL have significant reduction of Campylobacter diarrhea as well as all causes of diarrhea. The last but not least is the last mechanism of action of the HMO. We all usually know that HMO cannot be absorbed inside the bloodstream, yet we found that human milk oligosaccharides, 1 to 2% of them can pass and go to the bloodstream and can have a systemic impact. And this impact believed to be modulation of the immune system. During birth, after birth, still the immune system of our babies, as we mentioned, not mature enough. Human milk oligosaccharide helped to make the balance between the T helper 1 and the T helper 2. And this was demonstrated in Goring et al. publication in Journal of Nutrition 2016 when he compared formula uh, with GOS to formula with 0.2 gram 2 FL, other one with 1 gram 2 FL, and breast milk standard group as our reference guide, uh, guide group. We found that infant fed formula with 2 FL have a significant reduction in five inflammatory cytokines like interleukin 1 in the tumor necrosis factor and the interleukin beta. And it was a significant difference between the two FL groups as well, uh, to the control group, and there was no significant difference between the two FL group with the breastfed groups. My last uh, publication or last study for today was Pichu et al. When in a randomized controlled double blinded trial for 12 months with 175 healthy term infants, comparing infant fat formula with human milk oligosaccharides to control formula without human milk oligosaccharides, measure, uh, measuring the morbidity. We found that infant fat formula with 2FL and LNNT, HMO, 56% reduction of the use of antipyretics at the age of 0 to 4 months, have 53% reduction of the use of antibiotics from the age of 0 to 6 and 0 to 12, 57% reduction of lower respiratory tract infection from the age from 0 to 12 months, and 70% reduction of bronchitis from the for the whole year 70 percent reduction in the group using the infant formula with human milk oligosaccharides thank you very much and i hope i stick to time dr rajish i know that was time was limited so i hope i stick to the time thank you very yes, much yes yes thank you very much dr muhammad it was an excellent presentation so um, uh, if we, somebody has any questions they can pose it otherwise i would like to conclude the session please uh, uh, the, I would also like to thank White Nutrition and also uh, like to thank the executive committee of NNFI UAE chapter, which is Dr. Monica Koshal, Dr. Shridhar Kalyan Sundram, and also our ex expert uh, speakers, Dr. Ola, Dr. Khalid uh, as a moderator, and Dr. Muhammad as a speaker, who have given their time and spared. Um, their valuable time from the family to be part of this CME. Uh, I would also request our audiences to complete the survey so that they can get their CME certificates. Uh, to conclude, thank you, Dr. Ola and Dr. Khalid and Dr. Muhammad. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>